morning, everyone. I'd like to introduce Dr. Joseph Pentangelo, a linguist and folklorist. He earned his PhD in linguistics and a graduate certificate in medieval studies from the Graduate Center at CUNY. He's a postdoctoral fellow with Macaulay Honors College and an adjunct associate professor at the College of Staten Island, CUNY. His research interests are broad, and he is inter particularly interested in the documentation and revitalization of endangered languages, which was the focus of his dissertation. His articles have appeared in English language and linguistics, folklore, language documentation and description, and voices, the Journal of New York Folklore. He lives in Staten Island with his wife, Rebecca, and their cat, Baby Cat. I'd like to thank him for traveling from Staten Island today to speak to the Summit Oak Art. Hi, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Craig, for the introduction and for inviting me. Um, so yeah, I'm Joe Pantangelo. Just one quick correction. I'm an adjunct assistant professor, not an adjunct associate professor at the College of Staten. Okay, so just bear with me while I open the slide. That's good. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm presenting on who were the Indo-Europeans. I'm a linguist, so I'm presenting this mostly from a linguistic background, but people have addressed this exact same topic from a background in anthropology and in archaeology and even in genetics, uh, comparative mythology. So I'm taking mainly the uh, linguistic approach, but I'll touch a little bit on some of the other topics too, okay? Um, the first section I'm gonna talk about is what is and isn't Indo-European, like what is meant actually by that term, because it's, it covers some things, but it doesn't cover as much as people sometimes think it does. I'm gonna discuss how the Indo-European language family was discovered, um, what linguistic groups are part of it, and to some extent what that actually means for what a linguistic group is and what it means for a linguistic group to be a part of it. Is this better? And uh, what, what do we know about the Indo-European people? That's the section that is in some ways the most speculative because obviously we don't have time machines or anything like that. And we don't have grave markers that say, hey, I'm an Indo-European on it. So there's always gonna be some debate about who the Indo-European people were, where they come from and that kind of thing. But as years go by, we come towards more of a consensus about that. Uh, so for the first section, what is Indo-European? Basically what that word means, it's Indian and European. Uh, the Indo just means Indian, and that's the combining form, and European means European. Now, as I'll touch upon in the next section, this doesn't encompass literally every language and every person in India and Europe, um, and it doesn't only cover people in India or Europe, but we'll get to that. Um, it's the name given chiefly to a language family. That's something that's really important to know. It's uh, not about a certain race of people or an ethnicity or anything like that. When we talk about it and the way that this was developed, it was a language family. Obviously, people can speak a given language family who aren't genetically related to each other. So when we study Indo-European languages, we're studying the languages. Um, it encompasses a lot of linguistic subgroups or subfamilies in Europe and Asia. And in between, I mean, you can see India is at the far extreme over there and Europe's at the far extreme over there. And in between we have Anatolia or Asian Turkey. Turkish is not an Indo-European language, but the languages that were spoken there before the Turks came West were the Hittites, uh, especially, which we'll touch upon in a little bit. In Iran, the Iranian languages, including Persian, those are Indo-European languages. And many of the languages spoken particularly in Northern India and Pakistan, those are also Indo-European languages. So there's this one language family that spreads all the way from Portugal in the West over to India in the East. Um, and it was discovered that they really are related to each other. They have a lot in common. And there were languages spoken even further East than that in the past, which again, you'll see in a little bit. Um, Indo-European, the language, or Proto-Indo-European, we usually just call it PIE for short, this is the name given to that hypothetical ancestral language. So when we have tried to construct this ancestral language that all of these Indo-European languages came from, that language is called PIE. And we've actually come very far in reconstructing it, like this, 
is an American Heritage Dictionary of uh, Indo-European Roots, for anyone who's online with this. And uh, this actually, it's a structured like a normal dictionary would be, but it has what are supposed to be the roots of a bunch of different words that exist today in English and in uh, Italian and in Spanish and so on. Um, so for one example, just pulling a random word out of here, there's this word that in uh, Proto-Indo-European is reconstructed as having been gin, which was a root that meant to compress into a ball. It's the hypothetical Indo-European base of a range of Germanic words with initial K-N referring to compact knobby bodies and projections. So if we have a word like uh, knob in English, which is spelled K-N-O-B and a bunch of other words like that, those all probably come from this root in Proto-Indo-European that referred to things in a small compact ball. Um, so we've come pretty far in trying to reconstruct this. Now, of course, because we don't have anything that's written in Proto-Indo-European, we can never check it against something. We can never be 100% sure. But what you're able to do is uh, try to create hypotheticals for what this uh, ancestral Proto-Indo-European form would have become in one of the daughter language families. And we've actually found that to often be the case, where we've given a reconstruction and predicted what it would look like. It was a big issue in uh, the earlier 20th century when they discovered all these written records in Hittite, because it actually proved much of the hypotheses that they had made about what uh, Proto-Indo-European would have looked like. Hittite is the earliest recorded uh, Indo-European language, but it wasn't discovered until much later. So it actually worked as something really good to check against, and it proved that we were right about a lot of things and some things we weren't and you know that changed over time um it's also used to describe the culture of the people who would have spoken this language the people who would have spoken proto-indo-european so when we talk about uh indo-european culture we're talking about this hypothetical point in history where these people uh whose descendants spread the languages that are now you know english and italian and so on um but we can reconstruct their culture to some extent. So you can see there's this idol here. Um, I see that this, let me try to move this for one second, just so you can see it a little better. I know it's blocking the text, so I'll put it back in a second. But this is an idol that was uh, dug up, it was discovered in Ukraine, um, not too, too long ago in the 20th century. And it's uh, believed to represent the chief deity of uh, the Indo-Europeans. It has all of these um, sort of ceremonial tools arrayed around him. You can see that he's got a belt in his middle. And idols similar to this have been discovered in a bunch of different, uh, you know, like graves and that sort of thing. Um, there's this misconception sometimes, you see this more in the popular media than in academia, but it's still worth dispelling. This idea that Indo-European is the ancestor of all modern languages, that like everything, including Chinese and like Native American languages came from this one proto language. Maybe that's true, it could be, right? Humans have a common origin, but Indo-European was not that common language. Indo-European was the common language of a bunch of people, but certainly not of the whole world. Even many languages that are spoken in Europe and India aren't Indo-European. So like Basque is not Indo-European. Basque, which is spoken in Northeastern uh, Spain and the part of France that borders that, that language is actually believed to be the language that was, or one of the daughters of the language that was indigenous to Western Europe. Indo-European came in from the east, as we'll see on a map in a little bit. Um, so Basque is believed to be like a relic of like the truly indigenous European languages. Finnish is related to Hungarian and Estonian, and it also, it's a Finno-Ugric language, not related to Indo-European. So even though the Finns and the Swedes are so close to each other geographically, their languages are from completely different language families, as different as Japanese and Arabic are. Um, and Tamil in, in India, not an Indo-European language. Um, so this just shows, don't have the misconception that Indo-European is somehow like a, I don't know, like an almost supernatural or mythical proto-language for the whole world. It's not. Um, also, Indo-European isn't a race or an ethnicity. It refers to a culture and it refers to a bunch of different, uh, it refers to a language family with a bunch of different languages within it, but there's no like population that is genetically Indo-European. It's not, um, it's not a thing. And historically, a bunch of different groups uh, have tried to claim to be like the true modern descendants of the Indo-Europeans because there's some, you know, cultural or social cachet to, to this group. People have tried to say that like, oh, we're the real descendants of them. Uh, 
there's still like nationalistic claims to like different countries being the homeland of the Indo-Europeans. So you'll get like a national university at some random country saying like, oh, we found this research that proves we are the homeland of the Indo-Europeans. It's almost always just total pseudoscience, but um, it makes people feel good to make that claim. So I wanna talk now that there's a little bit of an overview. Hold on, let me just move this. It's a little better. This way you can see the pictures better. Um, Historical linguistics as a subfield. This is the discipline within linguistics that I was, uh, especially when I was first in grad school, the most passionate about. Um, it date back, dates back to the late 18th century uh, as part of this whole broader like enlightenment uh, paired with colonization thing that was happening around the world at the time. And what happened was European scholars discovered that a lot of European and Asian languages shared a bunch of features in common. So there was this sense going way, way back that like ancient Greek and Latin were related to each other. And there were suspicions that maybe English was related to them too, maybe German, that kind of thing. But it wasn't really a discipline yet. It wasn't actually academic yet. Um, they hypothesized, and I'll get to this process on the next slide, but they hypothesized when they realized that there really was a lot in common between a bunch of European languages and a bunch of Asian languages, that they must have come from a single common ancestor. That's PIE, what I was talking about previously. These Indo-European languages, they constitute one family, the Indo-European language family. In the century since, we've discovered a lot of other families, obviously. Um, it's not that Indo-European is the only language family, but it's really the one that we first started exploring, and it's the one that we really tried out these different ideas about how to reconstruct a proto-language and how comparative reconstruction works. So it has probably the most research done on it. And as a result, we have probably the most certainty in what the proto-language looked like. So this guy, Sir William Jones, that's the guy whose picture is up on here. He correctly posited as far back as 1786 that Sanskrit, Greek, Latin, Celtic, Germanic, and Persian languages were all related to each other. He was a, um, an authority in colonial India. He, I think he was an academic before that, but basically when he got into a position in colonial India, and he started familiarizing himself with Sanskrit because he was one of these guys who's really good at learning a bunch of languages. He realized that it was really similar in some key ways to uh, Latin and to ancient Greek. And he thought like there must be something to this. Um, so I'm gonna read this passage because I think that it's really interesting just how right he was as far back as 1786 before we had really done any of this research in a real academic way. He suggested, the Sanskrit language, whatever be its antiquity, is of a wonderful structure, more perfect than the Greek, more copious than the Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either, yet bearing to both of them a stronger affinity, both in the roots of verbs and in the form of grammar, than could possibly have been produced by accident. So strong indeed that no philologer could examine them all three without believing them to have sprung from some common source, which perhaps no longer exists. There is a similar reason, though not quite so forceful, for supposing that both the Gothic and Celtic though blended with a very different idiom, had the same origin with the Sanskrit, and the old Persian might be added to the same family. By Gothic, he probably meant all of the Germanic languages, often because Gothic was one of the oldest ones that uh, we were familiar with being written. Uh, people often use Gothic to refer to all the Germanic languages. Um, but this is really interesting because he was very right. Obviously his stuff about like, oh, it's a great structure, it's beautiful. Okay, like that's obviously very subjective, but his stuff about it being re related, uh, is a real hypothesis and it really is right. So I just want to talk a bit, little bit about how this reconstructive hypothesis uh, works, how you actually compare languages and see if they're related. You can't just assume that languages are related because they share similar words or even identical words. That's not sufficient because borrowing is a really major thing. So sometimes a language borrows words from another, that doesn't mean they're related. So in Arabic, this is alagrab. In Spanish, it's alacrac. Both mean scorpion. Obviously, these are very similar words. Alagrab, alakram. Um, in Arabic, the fruit in orange is naranja. In Spanish, it's naranja. Um, and uh, here's my mayor, Eric Adams. Uh, in Arabic, it's alcadi. And in Spanish, it's alcalde. Obviously, these are really similar words. They were borrowed. Is that sufficient to claim that, say, Spanish and Arabic are actually related to each other? You have these words that are virtually identical for orange. Really, they're identical. Um, is that enough? The Spanish borrowed these words. They're not actually related. 
How do we test that though? Like, how do we have an actual process to that instead of saying, gee, I bet that they borrowed them and that they're not really related. What we have to do is find a large number of correlations between form and meaning in the two languages we want to compare. So not just a few words, not a few specialized words, especially, but across the language, including core vocabulary. Core vocabulary are the words where borrowings rarely occur. A language is really likely to borrow words for new pieces of technology, new sort of fruits or foods that get imported, new religious concepts. If, a, if one uh, linguistic group conquers another, you'll get new words for positions of authority, that kind of thing. But really rarely does a language borrow a word for mother or for two or for hand or tree or house. Those are words that are part of core vocabulary. They're really rarely borrowed. Um, so this guy, Morris Swadesh, developed a list of core vocabulary words. So you can create what's called a Swadesh list in a bunch of different languages and compare them. And that, that way you're comparing the vocabulary that is very unlikely to be borrowed. Um, there are a few different Swadesh lists with like different numbers of words. So let's compare Spanish and Arabic using a portion of the Swadesh list. Here are the words for, this is just a small portion of it for I, you, he, we, five, long, thick, blah, blah, blah. You can look at it. I'm not gonna read them all, but you can see that there is virtually no correspondence between the Spanish and the Arabic words. We saw that their words for orange and for judge and scorpion were really, really similar. These words are really nothing like, right? I'll give you a second to look at them. Okay. Um, Spanish and Arabic have no similarity in core vocabulary whatsoever. They're definitely not related. Really now let's compare Spanish and Italian. We know that Spanish and Italian are closely related, but pretending we didn't know that, just looking at this comparison, we would see that they're really similar. Many of the words are identical. Uh, some of them almost seem exactly the same, but for spelling, like yo versus zio, really, really close words. And then others are just a little bit different, like cinco and cinque, very close, but a little different. But you can see madre and madre are the same. Um, there are some differences, but there's still a lot more similar. Spanish and Italian have a substantial similarity in core vocabulary. They are related. And part of this, which doesn't show so much with this list, is it's not just the words being the same, it's that there's a consistent correspondence. So to give you an example from English and German, often where English has the O sound, German has the I sound. So English ghost, German geist. English bone, German bein. English stone, German stein. So if there's a regular correspondence like that, like, oh, every time this language has X, the other language has Y, that counts as well. Even if it leads to words that seem really dis disparate, different from one another, if there's that regular correspondence, that works as well. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so Italian and Spanish, oops, excuse me. Italian and Spanish both descended from Latin. Luckily enough for us, Latin was actually written down quite profusely. Um, both Italian and Spanish are descended from Latin. They're sometimes called Romance languages because Latin was the language of the Romans. So this is along with French and Portuguese and Romanian and so on. Um, so let's test Sir Jones's hypothesis when it comes to the languages that he actually mentioned, right? He mentioned Sanskrit, ancient Greek, Latin. He mentioned the, Goth the uh, Celtic languages, so I'll include Old Irish. He mentioned the Gothic languages, so it's the Gothic up here, and Persian, because he mentioned it as well. And you can see the similarities that he was talking about. Look at the word for mother. It's almost the same across the whole, uh, across all of the columns. So Sanskrit, mater, is almost exactly the same as ancient Greek, mater, and Latin, mater. Uh, the words for father are really similar across. The words for brother, this is the sort of correspondence I was talking about. Can you see my cursor? Yeah. This is the sort of correspondence I was talking about where there's a BH sound in Sanskrit and a PH sound in ancient Greek. That's actually very consistent across the languages and where that surfaces as an F in Latin. So they're not actually that, that similar to each other, a B and a F sound, but where they're really consistent and they show up word after word after word, that's something that's really noteworthy. Um, so again, I'll just give you a little bit of time to look at this to see what I'm talking about. You can see that um, some of the words are not similar at all, and then some of them are basically identical across. The more different two languages that seem to be related are, we presume the longer ago they split apart. You know, you look more similar to your siblings than to your cousins, usually it's the same kind of thing. So he was right, Sir Jones. So the next question is, what languages are Indo-European? Um, 
A lot of languages that are still spoken today, some of the most widely spoken languages in the world are Indo-European languages, meaning that they come from Proto-Indo-European, um, but many more that aren't still spoken today, many languages that have died out. I mentioned Latin before, there are a bunch of others, and I'll highlight a couple that I think are interesting. So just to give you, all of us here speak English, just to give you a little bit of our language's family tree, we come from Proto-Germanic, and by we come from, I really just mean our language comes from. The English language ultimately, ultimately comes from Proto-Indo-European, but this family of the Germanic languages all come from Proto-Germanic, which is a daughter language of Proto-Indo-European. Um, so English is over here. The most closely related language to English is Frisian. This is spoken uh, in the coast of the Netherlands, basically. And this makes a little sub-branch of Anglo-Frisian. And then we are part of the West Germanic language family, along with the uh, Dutch or Netherlandic and German. And of course, there are a bunch of different types of German. The German spoken in Switzerland is very different than the German spoken in Northern Germany, which is different than the German spoken in Bavaria and so on. So this uh, is sort of a generalized family tree here. So these languages, English, Frisian, Dutch, and German are more closely related to each other than they are to say Icelandic, Faroese, Norwegian, Danish, and Swedish. Those form the North Germanic family. And then there was also an East Germanic family of which Gothic was the language, um, but it is totally dead now. Um, so you can see here that there's, you know, you can be closely related or relatively distantly related, but all still be part of the same family. Um, Proto-Germanic and the Germanic languages are the field within Indo-European that I have studied the most personally. Um, to give you another branch that's really well structured and well attested to, um, here's the Romance language family. So we have Latin up at the top, split into Classical Latin, which was the relatively artificial written form, and Vulgar Latin, uh, which Vulgar just means every day. Um, and then that split into Sardinian and a bunch of other languages in continental Romance. There was African Romance because the Romans had controlled a bunch of uh, North Africa, but it's no longer spoken there after the Arab conquests. There is Eastern Romance where we still have Romanian spoken. Um, and then in the West, we had French and Catalan and Spanish and Portuguese and so on. What's interesting here is Latin is for this family what Proto-Germanic is for the Germanic family. Proto-Germanic, though, wasn't written, whereas Latin was. So this allows us to test our methods by basically trying to reconstruct what would have been Proto-Romance by comparing, say, Italian and French and Romanian and so on, and then testing it against Latin to see how accurate we were, which is a pretty interesting um, thing. One of the languages that's extinct that I want to talk about is Hittite, because I think that it's a kind of cool one. Excuse me, I'm just trying to move this a little bit. The Hittites lived in Anatolia before the Turks got there. They spoke an Indo-European language called Hittite. They're shown in orange on that map. Um, its writing is from the 17th to 13th centuries BC. So it's super old, like almost 4,000 years old. And we found it written in these cuneiform tablets. And we were able to test a lot of theories that we had about Proto-Indo-European on it and you know, figured out what worked and what didn't basically. Another language uh, or a couple of languages that are really interesting are the Tocharian languages. These are Indo-European languages. They were spoken in what's now China in the Tarim Basin. This is the furthest east that any uh, Indo-European languages were spoken before relatively modern day colonization, right? Like whereas Hong Kong has a bunch of English speakers now and so on. Um, and there are actually depictions of Tocharian people. Like you see here, this was, I think, a Tocharian royal family, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this is writing into Carrion here in the center, and it's, uh, I, I just think it's really interesting be, be, because people never think of the Indo-European languages being spoken in China, certainly. So to answer what we know about the Indo-European people, there are a bunch of competing theories about their origins. Most agree on what's called the Kurgan hypothesis. A Kurgan is basically a burial mound, so this is a hypothesis based on the culture of people who built these Kurgans, like you see in this picture at the top. According to this hypothesis, the Indo-European language and culture developed in the Pontic steppe. These are the vast grasslands. They're basically flat north of the Black Sea, beginning about 8,000 BC. So the idea is that this culture developed here, the language developed here, and then they spread outwards. Um, Indo-Europeans were horsemen. They, uh, they domesticated horses that lived on these grasslands and they developed chariots. We know that because we have very old carvings and like cave paintings and that sort of thing showing this. 
Um, this afforded them mobility and military might. So not only did it lead to them being good uh, agriculturalists, but it also let them be really good warriors because if you're the only people with the chariot, you can conquer a lot of people. It's very mobile. Um, scholars have worked towards reconstructing Indo-European myth by comparing like ancient Greek and ancient Hindu and Norse mythologies, because these are some of the oldest ones that we actually have written. Um, we know a few things about that religion. We know that horses and other domesticated animals were sacrificed during religious rites. If your culture is very dependent on horses and chariots, you know that um, you know a horse means a lot to you. So sacrificing one, the thinking goes, would like lead to a lot of favor from the gods. You're giving up something that's really important to you culturally and personally. We know some of the deities, Deus uh, Pater, meaning uh, Godfather, akin to Jupiter. Um, the daylight sky god, he had a consort, the earth mother, he had a daughter, the dawn goddess, and sons who were divine twins, and there was a solar goddess. This is um, necessarily speculative. You can see this little asterisk. That means that it's a reconstruction. We don't actually have that word attested to anywhere, but it's what we've been able to reconstruct. Um, so that's it for the stuff that I'm touching upon. I hope that you'll ask me more specifics in the questions uh, in the Q&A session, I mean. Thank you. And if you don't get a chance to ask me something now, please feel free to email me and I'll get back to you. And I'm happy to uh, answer any of your questions. Thank you. So thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, I read about maybe 20 years ago where there were two kings, and I think you touched upon this in uh, one of the latest slides. Um, originally, who was uh, hypothesized, I guess, that these were ruled because of the mobility of you know, invaders that went to different areas. But then there was uh, another uh, idea that it really moved with agricultural practices. Um, what's the determining uh, you know, thought on that? Thank you. So to basically repeat that just for the Zoom audience, um, the question is that there are basically two camps when it comes to thinking about how the Indo-European language family was spread from where it was originally located. Was it through military conquest or was it through developing agriculture and that technology sort of peacefully spreading along with the culture who had developed it? Um, this is still not something that's completely settled. So in favor of the military camp, let's say, are people who point out that they had relatively developed weaponry. They certainly had chariots, they had horses, and uh, in what we're able to reconstruct of their religion, there was some violence. And there's there was this idea that there was a sort of three-part or three-leveled culture where there were priests, there were warriors, and there were just sort of everyday like peasants. And the idea was that there was a very important warrior caste whose whole thing basically was conquest. Um, Competing with that was the idea that maybe it spread more peaceably through agriculture. And part of the evidence of that was that there were a lot of agricultural terms that were Indo-European terms that were borrowed by speakers of other language families. Um, so I think that there's good evidence in both. One thing that I'll say is that it's almost ambiguous in many places. So for instance, I know that um, this is a little bit more recent than Indo-European, but it has to do with Germanic. There's a word that's borrowed into Finnish that means king, if I'm remembering correctly, which comes from Germanic languages. So often you'll have a language borrowing Indo-European words for positions of authority. Now that will definitely show you that there was some sort of a super straight of Indo-Europeans over this culture where they installed leadership and, and that kind of thing, but it doesn't really tell you much about how they actually got to those positions. So that ambiguity is why it's still uh, something that people are debating about. I would like to believe as a peaceable person that agriculture was the way that they spread. And I don't like to imagine that it was just a bunch of uh, bloodthirsty invaders, but I really don't feel confident knowing one way or the other, which it was. And I know that's an unsatisfying answer, but that's the best I can do, I'm sorry. Okay, we'll try a question from online now from Alan. Please, please say your last name, so I'll know which Alan you are. Uh, this is Alan Hamilton. Okay. Yes. Um, thanks for the presentation, professor, professor. If English is a dramatic language, 
why can't I or others see much links or similarities or phrases or much of anything from German when I see it? Okay, so the question is, if English is a Germanic language, why is it so apparently different from contemporary German, right? Why, when we look at, as an English speaker, why when we look at German, does it look so much different than say Spanish looks to an Italian speaker where there's a much higher degree of mutual intelligibility? There are a couple of reasons for this. First, English as a Germanic language doesn't mean that we are descended from German. A lot of people have a misconception that English being Germanic means it came from German, that German is somehow older or more established, which isn't the case. German is basically a first cousin of English. So we called it the Germanic language family. We could just as easily have called it the English language family, or for that matter, the Dutch language family. English and German and Dutch and Norwegian and Icelandic and so on are all languages that are spoken today, obviously. None of them is particularly older than the other as far as like a family tree goes. Part of the reason that there isn't such an apparent similarity is because of English's fairly unique history as a language that developed in England. Um, people came there from basically the coast of Germany and a little bit in the Jutland Peninsula and the Netherlands and spoke, uh, you know, a bunch of different languages that they brought together and created Anglo-Saxon, which is Old English, that looked pretty similar to the variety of German that was spoken at that time. Um, over time, the English people were conquered by the Normans. Uh, certain portions of England were conquered by Vikings who introduced their uh, Scandinavian languages, which were related to English, but were from the North Germanic family instead of the West Germanic family, so introduced some differences. This was all introduced to a population who had previously spoken Celtic languages. So, Ger so English over its history has, in a way, simplified so much more than German has. Our verbs barely conjugate. We don't have cases on our nouns. We don't have grammatical gender except in some pronouns. Um, so because of that, it has really beaten up a lot of English in a way that has simplified it and leveled it out in a way that never happened with, say, German. But I will say that when you look at core vocabulary, there's a ton of similarity. So we have water, German has Wasser, but it's spelled W-A-S-S-E-R. So you can see that those are almost the same word. Home and Heim, house and house, um, good and gut, God and Gott, right? Mother and Mutter, like the words that are in the core vocabulary are virtually identical. And because like we talked about, those are the words that are least likely to be borrowed, least likely to be changed in substantial ways. That's where we can see the similarities really shine through. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, any, anyone from the audience? Um, you know, I agree that there are certain ways that the spelling is not Yes, absolutely. So the question for those of you who are online is about sound change and how sound changes over time as a language evolves and changes and why it seems that some sound changes are almost unidirectional, like some sound changes are more likely than others. And so it is the case that there are certain trends in sound change that are much more consistent and dependable than others. So weakening generally is a lot more prevalent than strengthening. So weakening in its most um, serious form is where sounds just disappear. So it's really common for words to lose sounds at the end of them. Um, and less common, but still occurs for them to lose sounds at the beginning. It's much less likely that a new sound gets added. And what I mean by this is that if you have a word that is, say, three syllables long, over time, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years, it's likely that its descendant word will be two syllables long, far more likely than it'll be four syllables long. We generally reduce sounds. So that is a trend that is virtually universal, although we will find that some languages have a strengthening instead. One example of the strengthening is that um, in German, actually, there's a strengthening of consonants at the ends of words. So typically, a consonant that's unvoiced, like a t or a k sound, it's likely that it'll become voiced. 
And the reasoning for that is that as we speak, our vowels are all voiced in normal speech. We're likely to just keep voicing all of the stuff that's next to them because it's easier from an articulatory standpoint. It's easier to just keep the voicing going throughout, by which I mean that we keep our vocal cords buzzing. So if we say a word like big, that's relatively easy. Our vocal cords are buzzing throughout the whole thing. Um, in German, you had a sound change where things that were voiced in the ancestral language in Proto-Germanic actually became devoiced. So good became gut. That T is an innovation. English is actually more conservative than German in that sense, where we say good instead of gut, where we say God instead of Gott. It, but the fact that German has a strengthening there, that it took a voiced consonant and devoiced it to make a D into a T, um, that just shows that sound change can go in the other direction and that it can um, sort of buck the trend, so to speak. And this is why it's never truly unidirectional and you can never perfectly predict exactly how a language is gonna change. So sound change is something that is constant. Some languages are more conservative than others. For whatever reason, the pace of sound change is slowed. Certainly sound change is often slowed uh, as a language develops literacy. Language change in general is slowed when you have a written standard that everyone can refer back to. When everything is oral, the language changes much more quickly. But we can see in our own lifetimes that um, language changes and sound changes. So there's there are a bunch of things that you can look at within dialectology of the United States. There's the uh, Mary, Mary, Mary merger. So I, as a New Yorker, and many of you as New Jerseyans probably still have different vowels in Mary, like I married my wife, Mary, like Merry Christmas, and Mary, like Mary had a little lamb. For many Americans, they have the ass sound for all of them. I married my wife, Merry Christmas, and Mary had a little lamb, and they'll have the same sound for all three. Um, so sound change is happening in our lives. When I was younger, like I always say the word for the fruit as banana, I hear so many more people saying banana, banana, as opposed to banana now. So I'm hearing vowels change, like as I, you know, teach students and they get younger, their words are different than mine, which is kind of, I don't know, sad as a nostalgic person. But um, yeah, sound change is constant and something that's very cool and fun to look out for. Oh, you want to do one more? Yeah, we have a number online, Okay, but you can take another one here. Okay, Al Aho, we might have to repeat the question here. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor, for a fascinating talk. You're talking about one of the subjects that I've been interested in all my life, namely languages, although my current interest is programming languages, not natural languages. The question I have is, I know how programming languages get invented, especially uh, distinct programming languages. How do distinct natural languages get invented? Thank you, that's an excellent question. So the question for those of you who are here was, programming languages are invented. How are natural languages more or less invented? Like how did French pop up as a new language? Um, so the answer is that it's very hard to tell when a new language has developed. So a lot of people have controversy over whether, for instance, Scots, is a different language than English, or if it's just a variety of English that's spoken in Scotland. Um, there's a lot of question about whether there is such a language as Chinese, or if Mandarin and Cantonese are just as different from each other as, say, Spanish and French are from another. So why don't we consider those two different languages? There's a big question about, um, there's a really big question actually about Arabic. So throughout the yeah part of the world where people speak Arabic, there's modern standard Arabic, which is the form that everyone basically can speak. Um, but there's also regional dialects to the point that Malta is considered to have its own language, Maltese, which is descended from Arabic in the exact same way that say Moroccan Arabic and Egyptian Arabic are. And Moroccan Arabic and Egyptian Arabic are just as different from one another as Maltese is. So why aren't those considered different languages? So the fact that it's hard to tell where an actual language versus a dialect begins is a big part of this question. But another thing um, it has to do with where populations move to. So for instance, English developed radically differently from the other Germanic languages um, on the continent, in part because England is, an, or Britain is an island. So people were there and then they were no longer really as regularly in touch with people from the continent. If it weren't for modern technology, uh, the English spoken in America would have been way more divergent from the English spoken in England. If we didn't have radio and telephones and boats going back and forth so regularly, we can already hear that our accents are quite different from the English spoken in England. And we have some vocabulary that's different. If we weren't constantly watching each other's media, 
it would be even more radically different. And you can see that in um, populations in England that are relatively poorer, it's harder for Americans to understand because it's very different and we don't have that constant back and forth. So it's a combination of A, picking where a language actually begins, and B, populations separating and no longer having contact with one another. That really lets those differences shine. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Why did the various Indian Europeans begin to express their language in written form of similarities? How did that all come? What is the picture? Right, right. So, so, so the question is when did um, Indo European or writing develop among the different Indo European languages? I think the earliest one that we have attested to is Hittite, which I believe was like 18,000 years ago or something, some really long time ago. It's in the slide. I don't remember the exact number. That's the oldest one that we have written. Um, but it wasn't, I think that the old, um, like they're now Hindu, but they weren't actually in, considered Hindu at that time. Some of the oldest, what are now considered Hindu documents from Northern India. Those are some of the earliest myths that are written. The reason that comparative mythology is such a big thing within Indo-European is because a lot of the things that people wrote were these myths because they were really culturally important. They had religious significance and everything. So those sort of epics are some of the oldest things that we had written. So Sanskrit is, I think, the oldest one written that's still in any sort of use because it still has a liturgical use within Hinduism. Uh, Hittite is the oldest written period, but um, it's no longer in use at all. And then other ones like like Latin, fairly old, you know, a couple of thousand years ago, um, but not none of them are really close to the age when actual Proto-Indo-European itself was spoken. All of the writings that develop are after it had already fragmented into a bunch of different families and spread over a fairly large area. So there's always this idea that if we could get to the oldest written forms and compare those, then we'll have the most um, most conservative and most reliable reconstruction of the proto form. So it's thousands of years ago, but it's also thousands of years after Proto-Indo-European was spoken. If you want to do another online, we'll take one here. <clears throat> um, yeah, actually, I have, a, I have a quick question. I'll just slip it in here too. Uh, and that is, um, you know, I've been hearing for uh, many years about Indo-European and so on, because we're part of that family. But I assume that there are similar families of languages in the other regions of the world that in developed independently. Uh, and I assume that there are bodies of scholars that study those and try to put together those language maps as well. So could you comment? I mean, how many fundamental fundamental families like that, in, you know, proto families are there? There, uh, so you're absolutely right that there are a bunch of other language families. Indo-European is the first one that we really got any sort of study in. But um, there are definitely others. So one that's really well known and well researched is Afroasiatic, because that has a lot of written uh, documents in the same way that Indo-European does. So that Afroasiatic is the language family that includes Hebrew, that includes Arabic, that includes a bunch of the languages that are spoken in Ethiopia. So these are languages that are documented going like, similar to Indo-European languages going back thousands of years. So that's a really well known and well established language family. And then there are a bunch of other language families within, uh, you know, within the Americas. So I've often studied uh, the Iroquoian language family, which includes Penangeha, also known as Mohawk, and Oneida, and Onondaga, and those languages. Um, there's also the Algic family that includes Algonquian languages. Um, so there are basically every language belongs to a language family, and there are a lot of languages in the world. So I think that we're on the order of hundreds of languages. But there's this idea too that a lot of people have that ultimately, if you could go far back enough, because we humans all have a common origin, that there must have been some language that all of the languages ultimately descended from. It's just that it would have been so many thousands of years ago that it's just impossible to reconstruct it. But people work towards it. People who are interested in that question study what's called the um, nostratic language. But this is very hypothetical. It's nowhere near as reliable as Proto-Indo-European is, which is itself already hypothetical. Joe, uh, thank you for a <clears throat> wonderfully articulate and uh, <clears throat> frankly erudite talk. Quick question. Uh, back in our school days, we were often taught about the similarities in the other poems and stories of ancient writers. Yes. Uh, Homer's Odyssey and Virgil's Aeneid and the classics, I guess. Does that have any linguistic implications? Or does it just mean that one tended to copy the other? I think that it definitely does have linguistic implications. So for those of you who are listening over Zoom who may not have heard that, the question has to do with 
the sort of similarities between classical myth within the among the Romans and among the ancient Greeks and even I'll say among the ancient Hindus. Um, how do those similarities bear upon the question of linguistic similarities and the idea is that language just like myth are part of culture more broadly and that those cultures were related in the same way that the languages are related so the idea isn't so much that the uh, romans and the greeks may have copied one another although certainly that did happen in addition to that they were coming from the same wellspring ultimately. they were inheriting some of the same traditions so one of the proto-indo-european gods is reconstructed as like uh, deus pater as like the godfather that is what was Jupiter and, and all of the ancient religions of different Indo-European peoples have this sort of idea of like an ultimate God. They were all polytheistic and that there were a bunch of gods, but there was also one, an ultimate. And also tangled up in this is the fact that a lot of the earliest written records we have of any of these languages are mythological. So we can see that there are a lot of similarities um, between the languages because they're telling similar tales as well as between the tales themselves. <clears throat> Thank you. We're we're close to eleven thirty, but you have time for another question or two. Come online. Sure, I'm happy to. Wonderful. Okay, uh, Tony Bishop. Professor, thank you very much. It was a very interesting uh, talk, and one of my favorite subjects, languages and mythology. I speak a language called Ornyoro, which is an Afri a, an African Bantu language, which is spoken, you know a lot in East Africa, Uganda, uh, Rwanda, Burundi, places like that. And it's classified as Bantu because of the, the, the word for a person is Muntu and the word for a person is Bantu and it's common amongst those languages. Also, um, the mythology of a lot of these uh, uh, languages or a lot of these ethnic groups are very, very, they're identical uh, in the, the way they have all sprung from the same myth. And there is a, an idea that the ancient kingdom of Kitara, which combined east of the eastern part of Congo, right through what is now Uganda, down to parts of Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi. So, I've always tried to puzzle these things out. And I just find that the similarities between what you were talking about, the Indo, um, in, in Indo-European languages, there is a, an exactly a similar thing in East and Central Africa. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, for anyone who's been here, the question, um, the question was about the fact that the Bantu languages that are spoken in uh, sort of Central Eastern Af Africa around Uganda, that sort of area, that similar to uh, Indo-European, it's a relatively large language family. There are a bunch of Bantu languages that are spoken in Africa, and also similarly to Indo-European, the myths that are found in one Bantu, uh, let's say, linguistic cultural complex are also found in the others, so that there's a very clear continuity throughout the Bantu-speaking cultures, in the same way that there's a very clear continuity throughout the Indo-European-speaking cultures. And I think that this is probably something that's generally true about people because we're talking about culture and culture is something that is essential to people. And uh, I think that until you get the development of revealed religions, religions that have prophets like Christianity and like Judaism and like Zoroastrianism, until you have that, you have more organically developing religions that are really just an outgrowth of culture in general. So it makes sense that the language would also be spread in the same way as uh, uh, myths or religions would be. Thank you. One more question from online. Yes. Okay, Miguel Velez, but remember, we can't hear you in this room, so please keep it short. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I could listen to you all day. Um, my question really relates to the influence of conquest on languages and, and how you might try to untangle the effects of conquest um, to determine the original set of languages. So, so for, for example, you're, you're sheet on Spanish and Arabic. There are lots of words in, Sp in Spanish that are from Arabic because the Arabs ruled Spain for 700 years from 730 to 1490. Um, when you look at this, it seems to me, now this is related to Al's question, uh, our language has words, which are specific variables, but they also have a structure, which is the construction. 
I would guess that the words transfer from language, culture to culture when there's a conquest. For example, my word for pillow is almohada. Um, but the structure of the language would remain. Uh, is, there, is there a way to, to uh, determine the templates of the structures of the languages uh, so that you can compare the originals uh, pre-conquest? Yes. Yes. So we got a question for and here it was um, basically how does conquest impact a language? So if you have conquerors who speak a language from language family A, conquering people who speak a language from language family B, how can you sort of parse that out? How can you parse that linguistic impact out? And Miguel suggested quite rightly that whereas it's easy, relatively speaking, to borrow words from one culture, one language to another, it's a lot harder for that to actually impact the structure of the language, the grammatical structure. And that's absolutely right. Structures of language are often much more conservative than the vocabulary. So throughout our lifetimes, we'll see vocabulary change. We'll learn new words uh, very frequently. New slang will develop. Sometimes it'll become standardized as part of the regular language. Um, whereas it's a lot rarer that the actual structure of the language changes. Now, it's relatively conservative, but it still does change over time. But it's still true that the way we structure sentences in English is a relatively normal Germanic template, right? Even if we borrowed, we could theoretically imagine that we borrowed 100% of our vocabulary from, say, French or from Arabic for that matter, but the actual structure of the language would still be the same, meaning that we would still barely conjugate our verbs. We would have a marked past tense, but we wouldn't have a marked future tense. We would have to use a sort of construction by saying, like, I will run. We don't have a suffix that means in the future that we add to it. Um, that the gender structure in English, that we basically don't have gender on any of our nouns would remain the same, that sort of thing. Uh, that the adjective would precede the noun in English as it does so rigidly, we, we would always say, you know, a pretty dog or whatever. We would never say a dog pretty in English. We have a very uniform rule about where adjectives can go. That sort of structure and that sort of template um, is something that we can arrive at um, through basically asking speakers what sounds grammatical to them versus what doesn't or by doing a corpus study, which is where we have a huge compilation of a bunch of recordings or texts in a given language and just look at how they're structured. Um, and that is something that changes a lot less often than the vocabulary does. It still does happen. English, like I said, doesn't have grammatical gender anymore, whereas German still does. In Proto-Germanic, there were three genders. There were masculine, feminine, and neuter. So that's something that English has really changed. Um, these things do happen over time, but less often than just the vocabulary changing does. Do you want? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, again, we do have time and topics afterwards, so uh, let's let's stop here. Joe, thank you so much. And now Craig Sweetford would like to thank you on behalf of the old guard. Joe. Thank you very much for a very informative and very interesting presentation today. Uh, on behalf of the old Summit Old Guard, I'd like to present you with a Old Guard Certificate of Appreciation. Thank you very much. Just a little background on the, uh, on the certificate. Uh, the Old Guard of Summit was established December 2nd, 1930. Sometime later, the organization adopted the ORCID, which is on the cover, and still uses it today on its letterhead, its certificates, folders. The late Lager and Harrell nursery, ORCID nursery, was one of the um, first ORCID enterprises in this country and grew into the largest commercial producer and distributor of orchid plants in the US. That's a nursery that was in Summit. <laughs> Although Summit is no longer known for orchid production and distribution, at the time of the establishment of the, uh, the um, Olgard, they were very important in the economy and the community around Summit. So um, that's why the organization has adopted the orchid as their, as their logo and symbol. Um, one other way 
of thanking our speakers is the All Guard Salute. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm honored. <laughs>